Hello and welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all this afternoon. My name is Petra Slinkard and I am the Nancy B. Putnam Curator of Fashion and Textiles, as well as the Director of Curatorial Affairs at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, you are attending session 11C, 20th Century Textiles, and we have a fantastic um, roster of great papers to present to you today. Um, beginning with Kirsten Heitsky, Finding Matilda Fluga, a visual analysis, followed by Addison Nace, Folk Design, How Mexican Folk Art Shaped the Modernist World of Alexandra Girard, Kevin Kozbab, Between Design and Craft, Lucien Day, and Esther um, Hartsky, Andrew Gardner, The X Bell Hop and the Modern, Joel Robinson's Textiles, Black Identity, and MoMA's Design Collection from Mid Century to Today, and Ayaka Sano, From Silk Crepe to Banlon, The Experimental Textiles of Hanamori. And we are going to dive right in. Each presenter has 20 minutes. And if you would please um, put your questions into the Q&A versus the chat, and we will save all of our questions until the end. So we can begin with our first presenter, Kirsten Heitsky. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much, Patra. Thank you to TSA for this really wonderful symposium. Um, OK. Um, so I'm going to kind of take everyone on the journey of what this project was for me. Um, so I started this research for a midterm project actually during graduate school at NYU. Uh, the project itself was pretty straightforward. We were given a textile um, without any known information and then research and narrow down a time period and hopefully find a maker um, through interpreting the design, make, weave, printing method, etc. Um, what made it easier for the textile was it was lightly tailored to each of our interests, um, which mine was design movements in the early 20th century so that we would actually like enjoy uh, the process. This matters because when I first kind of came up with an idea, I just kind of barreled forward with like my first thought, even though something seemed a bit off. Um, but it was kind of backed up because I've actually found the object within um, the museum. It was the Met's digital collection. So I pulled, so this is the original textile. And then I pulled um, images of similar pieces, focusing on how the ground was more organic yet geometric flowers. Um, the feeling was slightly was off. I can see like the flowers down here. Um, the feeling that something was off never quite left, but I hadn't found anything to really position it contrary to the information I found. Um, that was until the day before my paper was due. Um, while trying to locate a piece I hadn't pulled from the Museum of the Applied Arts um, in Vienna's digital collection, I found this piece by Matilda Fogel, um, which was extremely similar to the original piece. Um, and then I kind of found her original sketch as well. So the pieces were too similar and the style was exactly the same as, so I searched her name and found the color proofs for the textile at the Cooper Hewitt. The piece I've been working on was actually misattributed in the digital collection. Instead of being, um, while yes, it was a product of the Wiener Werkstatt, it was not designed by Dagbert Pekka, but actually Matilda Flogel. So this led me on kind of the journey to kind of figure out who was she, um, because it really led to the question of like, who is she and why was I so quick to believe that it was actually Dagbert Pekka instead of someone else within the Wiener Werkstatt. And um, so, Here's another image of hers. A little background on Josef Hoffman, Dagwit Pekka, and what we do know about the Hotel of Slogel. Um, Josef Hoffman was a founding member of the Wiener Werkstatt, founded in 1903 with Kolmann Moser and Fritz Warndorfer. It developed out of a split in the Viennese secession and the influence of William Morris and the English artists and crafts he met. They had a desire to elevate everyday objects and remove the separation from fine art and craftsmen. This, is, this would add, quote, beauty to everyday life and thus make it worth living again, unquote, which was realized in the idea of Gestumkunstwerk or total work of art. Both Charles Robert Ashby's Guild in England and Charles Rene Mackintosh um, in Glasgow were highly impactful in the Werner Werkstatt's development and Hoffman's actual personal style. The influence of Mackintosh's strict black and white interior with four accents can be seen in Hoffman's work, which is known for its geometric figures. Um, Dagmar Pekka brought more of a decorative element to counterbalance Hoffman's heavy structuralism. Um, he started contributing to the Werner Werkstatt in 1911 before officially joining in 1915. 
He worked across departments in textile and fashion, um, but also in glassware, furniture, lace designs, um, and in fine interior, and was head of the Zurich branch of the Werner Werner in 1917. His designs are distinctive with a stylized version of natural motifs. Um, I kind of consider it like a more geometric Baroque. Um, Matilda Flogel was within the third generation designers out of the School of Applied Arts, um, where she was a student of, of um, Josef Hoffmann. After she graduated, she quickly joined the Werner Werkstatt in 1916 and worked for the Werkstatt until 1931, right and before it dissolved in 1932. Um, in some scholarship, she's actually stated as being one of Pax's most talented and dedicated students, but she actually never studied under him and actually with him at the artist workshop. So this presentation will look at designs by Josef Hoffman, Dagobert Pekka, and Matilda Flugel. During her time as a student, she partnered with Hoffman on some designs. So as we can see here, it's a design for some glassware. Um, and like Hoffman, there are many examples of Pekka's and Flugel's collaboration. So these are just a few images of them. Their similar yet distinctive styles can really be seen in this glassware. On the left, we have a piece where the glass piece itself was designed by Matilda Flugel and um, the decoration or the painting on it is by Dagobert Pekka. We can kind of see with below, it's another design from one of his textiles. He has a very, very specific way of drawing the human form with kind of very angular lines and straight torsos and um, shorter arms. His work is uh, heavier and more angular, so Flogel's more humanistic forms with lighter and almost rounder qualities. So we can see two of her designs for this on the right. The form is shaped more naturalistic and kind of the lines are a bit softer. Um, and then the piece in the middle is like another collaboration with the two. So to me, it kind of shows like a true collaboration where like Matilda Flogel probably didn't just do the glass piece, but the human form on it looks more similar to her work than it does to his. Um, while the kind of leaf shape and the lines are more similar to work that we see from him. Hoffman and Vogel continue to collaborate as well, as we can see in this glassware. Um, the sharp geometric lines are again really a signifier of Hoffman's work. Um, while the figures, it could be either way, but we see really similar um, animal figures in a later uh, textile piece by Matilda. Um, so while considering Vogel's place as either a student or peer of them, it is important to also consider the education that was available to Vogel at the time. Both Hoffman and Pekka were trained architects while Vogel was a study design and decoration. Even if she had wanted to, she wouldn't have been able to go to architecture, to architecture school at the School of Applied Arts until they started admitting women in 1920. Few art schools even actually admitted women at the time. Um, and their women's art school counterparts, their separate schools, were often unaccredited and dismissed as not being serious schools. So she, so really the question is, was she just a student or had she just been written this way due to the limitations of her education versus the architecture school of both Hoffman and Pekka? And then we can move into some of the textiles. Um, it, it can be difficult to date Werner Werkstatt textiles because the textile department actually didn't date individual patterns until 1919, creating nine years of undated and unattributed patterns. After textiles were registered by pattern names, designer, block cutters, and manufacturers, as well as the date of production. Many textiles today in collections will be within the dating range of 1913 to 1917, or even 1911 to 1919, due to this unknown period. Also, if a pattern was used in another department first, before it was used in textiles, it was actually recorded in their model book and not the textile book, um, adding the kind of to the confusion. Um, the textiles we're gonna look at are really all within this date range, um, showing the similarities and differences between these three designers. So here are the first one. Um, we have a top one by Josef Hoffman. So it's the same really strict angular lines with his floral motif sitting inside, which, and then you have the way Flogel approaches the same idea with really similar colors, but her forms bleed into the other lines and they're just not as straight as um, you'll see from Yosa Hoffman and often her um, flowers will bleed over. And then you have this kind of floral clover-like shape, which is seen in a lot of her work and it, it's really considered, or at least I consider it a signature of her work. Um, each designer really holds the DNA of their work, the strong geometric lines from Hoffman, the soft figure to work of Vogel, and the naturalistic geometry um, from Pasha. So again, we have um, 
again, they're approaching really, really similar ideas with kind of a diamond shape with flowers and a similar color palette, but you have the roundness of the flowers that you'll see from Fogel um, when Dagobert still has, or Pacus still has the, the lines and the more angularity. Um, and there's just more like space to his work. Um, these are two, I put these in here and they're two kind of, they're different for what you'll see otherwise with them, but I like to if they were in a really similar color palette. We don't have the exact dates for these, um, but Dr. Pekka did die in 1923. So it's within reason that it is pre-1920. Um, the angularity of both of them is very different, um, but you still have the space in between the lines um, and Pekka's and the same kind of clover flo um, flower shape um, and flogel. And then this is another example of kind of how Pekka's and Hoffman's designs differ. So again, we have the strict structuralism with Hoffman. This is one of his most well-known designs um, called Riva. And then you have how Packet approaches the same idea with uh, just more angularity. And um, this is still, so this one from Fogel actually could date a little bit later to 1921, which I believe it probably is closer to that just because of the stylistic differences. But it's the way that they all approach like a geometric flower shape. Um, but again, you see the same things like the tight geometry from Hoffman, the kind of softer round lines from Flogel, and then the kind of more spread out from Pekka. And this is just another example of how they each approach black and white. So really, they have three distinct styles. And Hoffman and Pekka are really known for their styles, where Flogel is just kind of left off to the side. But it kind of shows that she did have a voice, like, and she did have a point of view. Um, this is their approach to black and white. And then there was, of course, some bleeding over in the designs. This is kind of what I think is the best example of this, because um, it's also one of the most, to me, confusing example of Hoffman's work from 1910 to 1917, because it does not look like anything else he's done. Um, the form is kind of all over the place. There isn't the geometry. I found it in multiple places in multiple color ways, so it is believed that it is Hoffman's. Um, but stylistically, the Pekka's looks exactly like his, Flobel's looks exactly like hers, um, with the same clover shape. He still has the same angularity, and this Joseph Hoffman piece is just wild to me. So obviously that there is some bleeding over, and there is some collaboration within um, the Brennerberg strata. And here's their approach one more time, just to kind of show, again, the differences between their work. And so when I was dealing with the original textile, this part, this piece on the left kind of was like, okay, it's really, really similar, just with the different shapes. But really, when you're looking at the way the flowers are formed, um, you really see Vogel's influence. And um, so Werner Bergstedt, a scholar, Angela Vogel, considers Vogel a remarkably prolific designer, contributing 128 travel patterns during her time with the Bergstedt. Her designs did grow and shift over the years. Um, and you can see some influence from Peck and Hoffman later on just as you can see her influence on other designers within the organization. As the Verkstata hit financial difficulties again, it's important, it was important for them to adapt in changing styles and produce patterns that would market well. Um, she didn't have the name of Hoffman or Pekka to help push kind of an item itself. So she did have to flex her style, um, often kind of become a little bit more decorative later. And since Pekka died in 1923, he actually never had to make these considerations in any of his work. So we don't know what his work would have become um, in the late 20s. Um, Flogel showed work in all exhibitions after she joined the Werner Werkstatter and even edited and wrote the 25th anniversary book on the Werkstatter titled the English translation, the Werner Werkstatter, the evolution of modern applied arts, 1903 to 1928. So this is the cover of the book um, and it was published in 1929. Uh, so you can kind of see even a difference in the way that things were designed with the cover of this book. It's actually a raised leather. Um, so they, the Verkstatta did actually have to end up adapting and kind of fitting into more of the design styles at the time. So the book is not a straightforward history of the Verkstatta, um, but it's an art book. Sorry, the picture is trying to get better, but I can't get into New York Public Library because of COVID. Um, so it, the book is really has bold typography and graphics, and within it are articles, as you can see here, um, and images depicting the philosophy and style of the organization. Only a handful of artists depicted within the book, only who, quote, 
who by reason of their great talent and personal note have proven their value and have helped to maintain and further the high standard, unquote, are included. So Louisville herself has three works, including this textile design um, called Falter, and then these are two ivory figurines of hers on the right. And Hoffman dominated with 64 of the 154 designs in the book. Um, and Pekka's work is shown 32 times. So this is a an apartment that was designed by Josef Hoffman. And this is actually one of Flogel's piece. Um, the, P, the pick of Flogel to create and edit this book really supports her as, as the idea as an artist of significance within the Werner Bruchstadt, in that she is, as introduction states, which she did write, so that might be part of it, of great talent and personal note. Um, after Flogel left in 1931, she started her own studio and then passed away in Salzburg in the late 1950s. It's been written as 1958 and 56. This, the, this is the rest of the available personal information that I actually have on her. The rest of her story is hidden and is still not fully told. Um, she's just a piece of a larger discussion and a goal to reclaim the work of female designers and artists of the past. And then this. Um, this actually ends on a very positive note, though. Um, the Museum of Applied Arts in Vienna is actually mounting an exhibition that's going to open in uh, 2021 that focuses fully on the female designers of the Werner Werkstatter, uncovering their stories and correcting their place within the workshops. And so this is a list of uh, the 180 um, women artists of the Werner Werkstatter. Um, the female artists and the female customers really are the ones who helped support the Werkstatter and really kept it afloat as much as it could. Um, the museum has actually also put out a call for any personal information about any of the designers and artisans to fully piece together really who these women were who built up the workshop. So it seems that really this idea of representation is just not just on our minds but across museums as we're all trying to correct and find the women who were very influential in these design movements of the past. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, our next presenter, I'm pleased to say, is Addison Nace, Folk Design, How American Folk Art Shaped the Modernist Work of Alexander Girard. Okay, just to reiterate, my name is Addison Nace. I am a second year PhD student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and today I'll be presenting on the folk art of, or, on folk art and how it influenced the work of Alexander Girard. Um, so today I will be talking about three main themes around modernism, folk art, and appropriation. My questions for this project came from a place of trying to understand how folk arts or other indigenous art forms um, influenced modernist art movements. For example, what does it really mean to be modern? How might modernism have begun the problems of cultural appropriation um, that we are more aware of today? I felt like the work of mid-century modernist designer and architect Alexander Girard was an excellent place to explore these themes. Girard designed textiles for Herman Miller, as well as conducted multiple commissioned design projects, ranging from home interiors to the design of an airline company. Gerard is also known for his enormous collection of folk art from around the world, which is now housed in the Museum of International Folk Art in Santa Fe, New Mexico. While Gerard sees his collection practice as a gathering of various cultures um, to show his appreciation for art globally um, in what has been called now a humanist form of modernism, I believe that more research needs to be done in order to understand how the countless unnamed artisans within his collection influenced and shaped his design practice, as well as American textiles and interiors at large. So who was Gerard? He was born in 1907 in New York City to a French Italian father and an American mother who is from Boston. In 1909, the family moved to Florence, Italy, where Gerard spent his childhood. He often cites um, his curiosity about folk art to have begun with nativity scenes that he saw as a child in Italy. 
As a young man, he moved um, to London in 1924 to study at the Architectural Association School of Architecture. However, his career would eventually shift away from designing buildings to become more focused on the holistic design of buildings and interiors in particular. In 1932, he moved back to New York City to start his design career. And then later in 1936, he married Susan Needham. In 1937, the couple moved to Gross Point, Michigan, a suburb of Detroit, um, so that Gerard could begin working at the studio of Thomas A. Essling. While in Gross Point, the Gerards met the Ameses, um, who were at Cranbrook at the time, and forged a very close friendship. And largely thanks to his friendship with Charles Ames, um, Gerard was hired as the textile director for pan furniture manufacturer Herman Miller in 1951. His first collection of textiles would then be released a year later in 1952. At the same time that he was developing his work on textile designs, Gerard was also accumulating items of folk art from around the world. When he first moved back to New York in the early 1930s, Gerard happened to stumble upon a shop in Greenwich Village that sold Mexican objects and purchased his first item of folk art, um, which was a speckled ceramic horse from Tlacapaque, Mexico. When asked, why he bought the horse in the 1980s by Elaine Markhoutsis, a reporter for the Chicago Tribune, he explained, quote, why? Why do you look at someone and fall in love? I suddenly had to have the horse. I'd felt I'd beamed onto something, end quote. So thus his journey collecting folk uh, oak art objects began, and I believe with a particular love of Mexico. In 1939, Gerard and his wife Susan would take a late honeymoon trip to Mexico and their collection obsession really took off. They collected anything from tourist objects to more fine art pieces. The Gerards would eventually then take 14 trips back to Mexico um, to keep growing their collection. While today we may consider Gerard's collection to consist of folk art, he considered his collection to be one that was made up of toys. Despite many objects being made from fragile material, um, such as ceramics, as you can see within the ceramic village in this photo. By categorizing such objects as toys, Gerard's collection pursuits demonstrates an implicit bias of many 20th century thinkers that perpetuated fascination with the idea of the primitive and the idea of the gentle noble savage. However, I propose that through the interactions with objects and artisans working outside of the Euro-American imagination is what taught Gerard to be a better textile designer. So Gerard's early work in designs before he began to work in textile design, particularly before he began to work for Herman Miller, are much more flat and pictorial, as if translating objects or motifs of folk art into repetitive patterns. Um, I thought these two objects made a really interesting conversation with each other. They both show flowers blooming out of a vase, and yet both flowers are reduced to more geometric-like forms that may not resemble um, the botanical specimens of flowers. The artist who made the 19th century sampler on the left, Ms. Diaz, um, reduced the floral forms into geometric designs based on the restrictions of cross stitch, which like many other types of textile work, particularly weaving, forced the maker to think through design within a grid system. And with, by using a printing technique, however, Gerard is not actually very restricted, um, perhaps just choosing to make the design more simplified for ease of printing. Um, and at this point in his career, Gerard's style is yet to be defined, but I think the conversation between this object from his collection and this design shows clearly how his collection of folk art would serve as a significant source of inspiration. Um, 
Within his design work, Gerard would also come back to ideas of Mexico or Latinidad in more generally, very early on. For example, the two samples on the left are from his first collection for Herman Miller um, in 1952. They are both, they're named pepitas, which means little seeds in Spanish. The two samples on the right um, are from a 1960 collection and appropriately named Flores, which of course means flowers. This linguistic tie to Spanish demonstrates Gerard, Gerard's reverence of Spanish speaking cultures, um, but also may imply a sense of whimsy based on his understanding of Mexican made folk art items. This whimsical sentiment harkens back to Gerard's understanding of these objects as being tourist art or toys. Um, this view also contributes to overarching notions of non-European cultures being, quote, primitive or, quote, exotic within modernist discourse. Furthermore, so this collection of samples by Alexander Gerard were titled Rayamex um, Stripes, which he designed in 1966. As some of you will notice, rayas means stripes in Spanish. And so the name of the samples is entirely self-referential, yet it also tacks on the exotic reminder that these items were inspired by a not so far by the not so far flung culture of Mexico. The object from Gerard's collection I have paired them with is a string game toy from Michoacan, which I think appropriately shows how his collection serves as a source of inspiration, especially given that these objects were likely acquired about a year before this collection of stripes was released. Gerard's fascination with Mexico and its folk arts and crafts extended into, further into his professional life in the early 1960s when he set up the production of a series of fabric with the Fabrica de San Pedro or the San Pedro factory within Urepan, Michoacan, Mexico. This factory was opened by two American expats named Walter and Bundy Ilse, who moved to Mexico in the 1950s. They shortly established their small textile company, which they named Telares Urepan, which essentially means um, fabrics from Urepan. And Telares Urepan is still around today, but at a much smaller production scale um, and no longer is part of the Fabrica de San Pedro. Um, the former factory became a cultural center in 2016, so now Telares Urepan are produced in what used to be a former storeroom. So the cottons that Gerard produced with the Fabrica San Pedro were appropriately named Mexi cottons, which is another self-referential wordplay to describe where the fabrics were made and from what material. As we can see in this slide, which is coupled with a Mexican ceramic sculpture from the, brown, from the 1960s from Gerard's collection, the colors are clearly meant to evoke a sense of the touristic imagination of far off warm beaches, colorful folk crafts, new foods, and rich culturally associated traditions. Within his partnership with Telares Urepan, Gerard began to learn more about how um, weave construction might be used to create design, and in particular about how the warp might be used to create patterns from, stri um, from stripes to what he called um, his Mexi dot collections, um, which you can see in the yellow um, sample in the upper left corner, as well as the green and blue sample next to it, and the red and white speckled striped sample below the blue and green one. Um, this technique of using the warp to create stripes is incredibly common all across the world because it's pretty simple. Um, but because this collection was made in Mexico, I believe that there was a specific Mexican influence of the construction of the Mexidot pattern. I had originally hoped to conduct oral history research on this idea to back up this point, but due to COVID-19 was unable to travel to Mexico last summer. So this idea will have to remain in theory for now. 
Um, so within communities in Mexico, and in particular, the Sotzial Mayan community of Zinacantan in Chiapas, winding two colors within the warp is a common technique for the design of their clothing. In the photo of, on the left, we can see two girls wearing their traditional clothes um, with this similar warping pattern um, while also winding a warp. This photo was taken by Lauren Greenfield in 1991 and can be found in Patricia Greenfield's book, Weaving Generations Together. On the left is a contemporary huipil from Zina Cantan designed by Yolanda Hernandez, the head coordinator of Cooperative Mujeres Sembrando La Vida, um, which is a cooperative I've worked with since 2016 and was able to do field work with. Hernandez uses traditional backstrap weaving techniques to design her creations and create more contemporary styles. Um, so in this slide, we have a close up of this warping technique using two threads. Um, the sample on the left shows Gerard's Mexi dot design. In the center is a close up of the Hui Peel designed by Yolanda Hernandez. And on the far right is a belt from 1930s Mexico that I pulled from the Helen Louise Allen textile collection here at UW-Madison. This technique of warping with two colors can also be found in multiple styles of woven bands um, in Oaxaca, as well as other parts of Mexico, as demonstrated by the belt on the far right. This visual evidence shows that by working in, in Mexico and through his travels searching for items to collect, Gerard began to pay attention to the indigenous textiles within the regions he visited. Because he did not have a formal education in the making of textiles, Gerard's design practice was enhanced by the knowledge of the indigenous makers he interacted with through collecting their work and even through, um, even though many of these makers still remain nameless to us today. This final influence I want to discuss um, from Indigenous Mexico that I believe had a great impact on Gerard was the cultural significance of cochineal. While cochineal may not have been used much at this point in time due to the accessibility of commercial dye stuff, reds, pinks, and magentas have always been a part of Indigenous Mexican dress. I don't want to go into a whole history of cochineal because that would be an entirely different lecture, but I will speak on a few points. Cochineal was kept a secret from the rest of Europe by the Spanish for as long as possible because it was the brightest red dye 16th century Europeans had seen. Um, and they really wanted that beautiful red. The dye, however, is more receptive to animal fibers. So it may have been more of a bright scarlet red. Um, so it would not have been that bright scarlet red on the cottons indigenous to Mexico. While cochineal, uh, when cochineal is used to dye cotton, it turns out to be more like a magenta than a red. So because indigenous communities across Mexico consistently select reds and magentas to be part of their traditional clothing, we can speculate on the significant mark cochineal has impressed onto the cultural memory of the people, as shown by my selection from Huipilis, um, from the Helen Louise Allen textile collection. And unfortunately, there's not a long archeological record in Mexico. Um, Gerard's mixtures of magentas, reds, and oranges harken back to this form of Mexican indigenous memory. According to Gerard, the use of such colors in mid-century America carried a connotation of a double-barreled horror. And yet Gerard continued to pursue these radical color schemes in his textile designs, um, which I feel like shows how much um, indigenous Mexico impacted his sense of color, which Gerard is really well known for. And in conclusion, Gerard's modernism was characterized by what has been called modernist, humanist modernism, which was his understanding of the world being connected through art. Gerard's collecting process shows that while he felt a connection to the cultures he interacted with and collected art from, 
he saw the objects merely for their aesthetic and decorative purposes, hoping for the items to become forms in interiors that would provide joy and whimsy to adults who had forgotten how to play with toys. Gerard's cross-cultural interactions would ultimately influence his design practices and understanding, which may be characterized as appropriation. While Gerard's borrowed ideas from across cultures, his design practice remains unique and separate from the cultures that inspired him. While Gerard was a man of his time and still held problematic views of the people he supported in his folk art purchases, Gerard keenly demonstrates that cross-cultural appropriations do not always cause harm to communities. Rather, Gerard's obsessive collecting has inspired many people to learn about the arts and traditions of other cultures, including myself. The work that I believe must be done now is to give proper credit to the communities who have changed our ways of thinking, designing, and living. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next presenter is Andrew Gardner, the ex Bell Hop and the Modern, Joel Robinson's Textiles, Black Identity, and MoMA's Design Collection from Mid Century Modern to Today. So thank you all for joining uh, today and thank you to the Textile Society of America for allowing me to present some of this research uh, to all of you. Um, my name is Andrew Gardner. I'm a curatorial assistant in architecture and design at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, so in the fall of 2017, a mid-century American designer named Agel Robinson came to my attention thanks to the efforts of colleagues at the New York Textile Gallery, Cora Ginsburg, who identified him as the first Black designer to have been shown in MoMA's series of good design exhibitions in the 1950s. After doing more research, I discovered that one of the textiles by Robinson that had been shown in a good design exhibition was in fact already in the architecture and design study collection, officially acquired in 1975, along with some other errant printed textiles from the mid-century held in our storage. That textile, ovals number, number two, which you can see um, on your left, is therefore the first work by a black designer to officially enter MoMA's architecture and design collection. In 2017, we acquired a few more examples of textile designs authored by Robinson, including his now iconic ovals, which forms the backdrop of the portrait of Robinson that you see on the right. There are now five full selvage width textiles by Robinson, including two lengths of ovals number two in the full collection of the Department of Architecture and Design. And the distinctions between our study collection and our full collection are somewhat nebulous, but uh, nonetheless, they're in our full collection. Um, examples of which were featured in various good design exhibitions between 1951 and 1955. A handful of other works by Black designers have joined Robinson in our collection since 1975, including The Viewmaster by Charles, Charles Harrison and a set of Black Panther newspapers designed by Emery Douglas. Though even today, the A&D collection remains uh, overrepresented by white designers, the subject of a different talk. Like so many others featured in the Good Design series, whose promising careers never gained the traction that recognition by the Museum of Modern Art might reward, Robinson's story of relative obscurity is not singular or unique. But unlike the countless others whose work was on view in the Good Design series, most of whom were white, who, uh, most of whom were white, fighting to make it in what Ebony Magazine called the lily, lily white field of design, as a black man from New York City must have carried with it a unique set of challenges, a consistent and sustained battle against the prevailing forces of institutional racism. My paper seeks to bring to light what little we know about the promising talent of Joel Robinson, a trained architect, ex-bellhop, and a designer of textiles and furniture, to shed light on a story that until now had lar largely been hidden from ours and MoMA's view. I will look at Joel Robinson's career in the larger context of MoMA's early 1950s good design initiatives and focus on how African American media outlets like Ebony Magazine created a venue for the celebration and, ex and expression of black excellence, sharing for the world the work of many who might otherwise escape the spotlight of the mainstream white press. My research serves as a beginning, not an end, a way to assess the institutional histories that so readily enshrine the careers of some but not others 
and the ways that such history require re, such histories require near constant revision. MoMA's second annual Good Design Exhibition, which opened on November 27, 1951, featured 335 objects brought together in the museum's first floor galleries in a display designed by the Danish designer Finn Juell. Among the new to market uh, home furnishings on view were 70 plus fabrics, many hung at the edges of the room to emphasize their collective volume, which together revealed a range of surprising patterns and materials. And you can see this here and all um, another slide, you'll see a slightly closer up version of where Joel Robinson's textile comes together. Uh, four printed textiles um, manufactured by L. Anton May Inc. were included in this selection, each produced using the firm's signature Belgian linen and retailing at Bloomingdale, Bloomingdale's for $9 per yard. A press release jointly issued by MoMA and the Chicago Merchandise Mart earlier that year singled out one particular May fabric, calling it a, quote, fascinating essay in graded proportions, printed in charcoal and black on white. That textile, designed by the New York designer A. Joel Robinson and called ovals, achieved its dazzling effect through the repetition of elliptical forms, layered one on top of the other that recall the pattern of, a, of an architect's stencil. Another version of Robinson's textile, called ovals number one, made repeat appearances in the 1952 and 1955 editions of Good Design, a rare feat usually reserved for only the best known designers of the day. And there you see um, a little, my little uh, reference to Joel Robinson's textiles and ovals um, here on the right. Developed in collaboration with the Museum of Modern Art and the Chicago Merchandise Mart, then an important wholesale center for retailers across the United States, the Good Design program was devoted to surveying the contemporary American design marketplace. A scion of a Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania retailing empire, MoMA curator Edgar Edgar J. Kaufman Jr. launched the Good Design exhibitions in 1950 to connect the museum going to connect museum going audiences with the latest examples of contemporary furniture, fabrics, lighting, home appliances, and other household goods. A committee comprised of Kaufman and two other members, chosen from a rotating cast of design experts of the day, met twice a year in Chicago, once in January and once in June, to make their selections. The criteria for branding objects with a good design seal of approval was generally subject to the individual jury's discretion. But as, MoMA, uh, but as a MoMA press release from, the 19, from 1950 makes clear, all selected designs had to be, quote, intended for present day life in regard to usefulness to production methods and materials and to the progressive taste of the day. The committee's selections were first shown in an exhibition in Chicago at the Mart an edited assortment of, what was, of, of which was later brought to MoMA in the fall to coincide with the, the holiday shopping season. And each exhibition was also accompanied with a um, buying catalog and people could go to various retailers and purchase these um, wares. Good design was a catalyst for wider acceptance of modern design in America, Kaufman believed, a vessel that embodied the principles of modernist design form follows function being one, that from the very beginning, the Museum of Modern Art sought to embed into public discourse. For five seasons, the good design exhibitions were a marked success, positioning MoMA as a leading voice in the realm of contemporary design. Claiming the endorsement of the good design committee was a boon for American manufacturers and retailers who prominently utilized the name in advertisements and store displays, sometimes erroneously designating products as, as a Good Design Award winner. An advertisement for L. Anton May Inc. Fabrics did just that, celebrating the firm's Good Design Awards in the December 1951 issue of Interiors Magazine. Um, and just to note that it is it very clearly were not awards that were being handed out, but in fact, they were just selected um, featured objects in the exhibitions. Oval serves as the backdrop for the ad, which celebrates the work of five American designers whose work was identified by the committee. Uh, including uh, Paul McCobb, Paul Rand, Serge Chermayev. Uh, such recognition helped working designers as well, many of whom were looking to break into the burgeoning post-World War II American market. Robinson, however, never raised his profile to the level of many fellow designers who participated in the exhibitions, 
despite repeated signs of his breakout talent. In the May 1952 issue of Ebony Magazine, a multi-page story on Joel Robinson's burgeoning career called him, quote, one of the most promising newcomers in the highly competitive field of fabric design. According to the editors, the, quote, youthful, multi-talented New Yorker was the first Black person to crack the fabric design field, and also the first to be recognized by MoMA's Good Design Initiative. At 29, the former bellhop had just developed a new fabric printing process, which Ebony editors claimed would revolutionize the textile industry. A profile portrait of the handsome designer with his ovals fabric design in the background appeared at the top of the article, while his sister, Mrs. Callie Middleton, models an elegant ovals dress designed by the pair in an image on the same page. Subsequent pages reveal his industriousness, placing him in a studio designing new fabrics, in the factory selecting color swatches with, with Anton May, his manufacturer, at the easel with one of his paintings, tobacco pipe in hand, and at home moving a chest of drawers of his own design into place. Robinson's multifaceted career is further described, indicating that he wrote and illustrated a children's book and also worked in advertising as a graphic designer. According to the article, Robinson turned to architecture as a course of study at New York Univers University and then at Cooper Union, but found that no one would hire him. He picked up work as a caddy and bellhop to pay the bills. Eventually, Robinson made a name for himself at Hartwell Ales Advertising Agency, designing a series of successful 1940s campaigns for Steuben Glass. It was this work that brought him to the attention of May, who in 1948 had left Knoll Associates to set up his own printed textiles firm. Robinson's success developing the ovals fabric with May, who at the time worked with prominent designers like Serge Tremayev, Paul Rand, and Alvin Lustig, led to the introduction of three other patterns, including Glenn Plaid, Honeycomb, and Roman Candles. Roman Candles, as uh, we saw earlier. Robinson capitalized on his growing clout by crus crusading for uh, increased invisibility of black designers in the textile industry, as the article concludes. The forthright and upbeat portrayal of a designer on the rise was by no means a rarity in the pages of Ebony, which along with sister publication Jet, became one of the most potent crusaders of racial equality in post-war America by publishing stories of successful black Americans succeeding in the face of incredible odds. Founded in 1945 by entrepreneur John H. Johnson, Ebony uh, appealed to the growing middle, uh, black middle class by challenging stereotypes that were pervasive in mainstream white culture. Ebony, a monthly magazine, and Jet, a weekly, portrayed the everyday experiences of African Americans at work and at home, which helped to reinforce a more positive image of the black experience more generally. An October 1952 photo feature entitled Wealthy Bachelors introduces us to the fabrics designer Joel Robinson yet again, pegging him as, quote, the 29-year-old celebrated New Yorker who has, who has sideline careers as an advertising artist, technical illustrator, and furniture creator. His enviable $10,000 per year salary, which is nearly $100,000 in today's dollars, made him a desirable catch. But as the article makes plain, he, quote, has no city girlfriend, insists he's too busy to fall in love. As the letter to the editor, uh, a letter to the editor from Mrs. Dolores Robinson in July 1954 indicates that Joel Robinson's exposure in the magazine did, in effect, put the fabric designer's bachelorhood to an end. Quote, it's because of your wonderful magazine, Ebony, that I am one of the most happy girls alive. In the May 1952 issue of Ebony, you had an article on Joel Robinson, a fabric designer, and that's how it all started. We have been married now since October, and I know if I hadn't seen him first in Ebony, all this happiness would not be mine. That Joel Robinson appeared on numerous occasions in the pages of any main mainstream magazine of the day would be extraordinary. But in the pages of Ebony, it felt just right. The kind of successful yet everyday African-American that Johnson sought to highlight in his magazines over and over again. Robinson, along with countless others who appeared in the pages of Johnson Publishing magazines, was the personification of blackness made ex excellent, a person succeeding against incredible odds to do things that a generation previously might have existed only in the deepest realms of the, the imagination. Aside from mentions in Ebony, 
Information on Robinson's life is thus far limited, but what we know reveals a man who continually tested the limits of the color barrier in his work as a creative professional. After leaving school in the early 1940s, having studied architecture, it is not known yet whether he graduated uh, from either NYU or Cooper Union. He found design work as an, as an art director in, uh, for the magazine of the National Aeronautical Association. After working on advertising and illustration projects during the war, he moved on to a series of ad agencies, including Hartwell Ailes and then William Douglas McAdams. He designed sheet music covers from the 1940s, inclu including for a gal in calico from 1946, which you can see on the upper left-hand corner, and likely also the cover of the Contemporary Reader, a progressive African-American literary quarterly edited by Benjamin Brown. He's also likely the designer of the cover for the 1947 novel, God is for White Folks by Will Thomas, published by Creative Age Press, which is uh, something I recently found out uh, after a professor in upstate New York contacted me. Um, in October 1953, Robinson married and settled in Brooklyn with his new wife, Dolores. In February 1954, um, as you can see in the um, middle of the presentation, uh, Jed announced Robinson's promotion from creative art director to executive vice president of the David D. Pollan Advertising Agency, a New York firm that specialized in packaging design. Subsequent mentions of his life in African-American media outlets like New York Amsterdam News suggests he was the director of the Manhattan School of Printing in January 1965, though it's unclear whether this was the same school as the New York School of Printing, now the High School of Graphic Communication Arts. Uh, in 1971, he joined the National Distiller, uh, Distillers Products Company as National Merchandising Manager. And the March 9, 1985 issue of New York Amsterdam News mentions Robinson's issue and inclusion in an exhibition of contemporary Black artists at the Great Neck New York Library. I was contacted at one point by his son, who mentions a brother, but have not heard back after repeated attempts to make contact. And they've said that they have um, access to their father's uh, other textile designs, artwork that he created, sculptures, etc. So I'm still working on hearing back. In sum, his life is but a trail of breadcrumbs, a mystery that continues to unfold. Robinson's inclusion in Good Design 1951, 1952, and 1955 is a story like countless others featured in these exhibitions, a brief moment in the spotlight for a career that one can only hope went on to flourish in relative anonymity. But his story also illustrates the degree to which the system critically disenfranchised black designers from the start. It points to the ways that institutions like MoMA, whether knowingly or not, actively participate participated in this disenfranchisement at a moment when the museum was solidifying its clout in the realm of contemporary design. As Mabel Wilson, a uh, professor at Columbia University, recently wrote, <clears throat> professor of architecture, I should say, recently wrote of Robinson in her essay, White by Design, for the 2019 MoMA publication, among others, Blackness at MoMA. Through its exhibition making and its collecting practices, MoMA shaped the historiography of modernism, playing a leading role in defining and setting the agenda for contemporary design practice in the United States and elsewhere. That Joel Robinson is the first black designer to enter the collection and only the third whose work had ever been on view at the museum when his textiles were first shown in 1951, speaks volumes about the design industry's notable lack of diversity. After all, it wasn't until the year 2000 that another work by a black designer entered the MoMA collection, Entity as Information Zoom, by Canadian architect Gordon Kipping. As Robinson's career developed in the 1950s, what emerges is a portrait of a man with boundless creativity, producing a variety of fabric designs for May along well-established, highly regarded white designers of the day. That he appears in ebony as a fabric designer on the rise is just validation of what the good design exhibitions had already made clear. This was a designer worth watching. The obstacles he must have faced to get to that point are indeed an indication of the adversity he was forced to overcome, that he couldn't get a steady job after stint studying architecture at NYU and Cooper Union, likely owed more to who he was than to his own innate talent. His meteoric success in the years between 1951 and 1955, from his inclusion in Good Design three different times, to his promotion to executive vice president at a New, at a New York advertising firm, confirmed that he had found a path forward, a way to make it as a creative professional. This is a story that has no conclusion. It's a beginning, 
a place to start as institutions like MoMA seek to expand the canon and tell a richer, more nuanced story of visual culture. The project of cultural workers today is not to condemn existing narratives, but to work to redefine them. Insert new stories that hopefully, hopefully give us a much richer understanding of our own human experience. Joel Robinson's tale is but one figure in a vast ocean of possible narratives, a figure whose own unique talent is worthy of our praise alongside titans of the design field. This is a story still being written, a project that reminds us that museum collections and by extension art histories are in constant need of reappraisal. Thank you and uh, thank you to all who helped me shape some of this research. Look forward to discussing more and feel free to contact me here. So I'd like to uh, ask our presenters to turn their cameras on or our moderator and we have some questions and if you have questions as we are working through um, please do put them into the Q&A um, but I think it's fair to offer you all a, a round of congratulations and applause thank you so much for all this wonderful research and sharing um, these wonderful stories with us um, so I'm going to dive right in and I will begin at the beginning. Um, some of these questions have been answered privately or publicly, but um, not on screen. So the first question is for Addison and that is, what is the limit when a designer f falls into appropriation of someone else's work? Do you think it's possible that we can measure this and what can we do? Um, and thank you very much. Interesting research and congratulations. Um, thank you so much, um, Marisi, for asking this question. Um, well, I think, so one of the problems with the word appropriation is right now it has so many negative connotations um, when really um, like appropriation is, is a borrowing or like a taking. Um, and so what I think here is more of the problem is when misappropriation happens, uh, when there isn't credit given to a culture, um, and especially when that causes harm. Um, and I mean, I feel like this is um, not really a measurable kind of perspective because there's a big gray zone that things can fall into. Um, and especially like there's a lot of long history that has led to the problems of appropriation that's rooted in colonization and imperialism and current power dynamics. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I think it's just a big gray zone and everything might need to be considered on a case by case basis. Um, but I think what we can do right now is if you are um, doing a design practice and I've worked on um, designing a curriculum with some colleagues at UW around this for our design students around like how you can um, take inspiration from different cultures but give credit or also um, I feel like Gerard's work is a great example of how um, inspiration can be drawn from other cultures but you can still come up with new designs. Um, so thank you so much for that question. Thank you Addison. Uh, the next question is from Monica, and this is for Andrew. Um, she says, apologies if you covered this earlier in the presentation, but did the selectors for good design know that Joel was a black designer, and how many other designers in 1951 were non-white? Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Petra, and hi, Monica. Uh, nice to hear from you. Um, so the as, as far as um, as far as I'm aware, everything uh, indicates that the panelists who were selecting the things that actually would go on view at the Good Design exhibitions it was somewhat of a blind selection process. However, there's obviously examples of many designers who were directly in ch in touch with Kaufman, who would of course know uh, would have known um, that the designers themselves were white. Um, from my kind of preliminary glance, the 1951 exhibition had um, the work of one Japanese American ceramicist, Mini Nagoro, um, and then a uh, silk piece by uh, an artist I'm not familiar with named Tao Pang uh, uh, Sananicorn, who I believe, that I'm, I'm just totally guessing here, but I believe is that name is uh, either Thai or possibly um, Khmer Cambodian. But uh, other than that, um, as far as my, ex my research indicates, 
those are the only three people who would have been non-white in this seat in the selection of 335 objects on view. Uh, this is another question for Andrew. Uh, did the Johnsons of Ebony support Joel Robinson? Did he produce textiles for clothing which might have been shown in the Ebony fashion fair shows? Great question. It is a great question. I, I, to be honest, I don't know the answer to it, but I actually love uh, this as a potential avenue for research. You may have heard that the Ebony Archive was recently acquired by, I believe, the Getty. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong about that. Um, but I, I have not spent time looking at Ebony Fashion Fair, or Fair Fashion shows. Um, it does beg the question, though, of whether Johnson himself or Robinson himself actually designed any other uh, dresses besides the one he, he uh, designed with his sister in that one photograph. And I do not know um, the answer to that question. So that's kind of a continued, it's a continued process. And also just um, to co go back to one of the other questions in the Q&A from, from Lee Wishner, just to say that there are many other people for whom um, this project wouldn't have been possible. So a huge thanks to, to William de Gregorio at um, Cora Ginsburg, as well as T.T. Hall. Um, and then also shout out to Susan Brown at Cooper Hewitt, who uh, helped me with uh, a lot of this, this ancillary research. And I know she might be in the audience as well. So thank you all. Thank you. Um, this question is for our entire um, selection of speakers. Uh, Deborah asks, or says, um, I'm not aware of the issue of cultural appropriation being part of criticism in other arts, such as ceramics, furniture, architecture, etc. Is this correct? And if it is, are textiles and clothing being held to a more rigorous standard? And is this a form of discrimination against women? Would someone like to? Would someone like to offer to go first? Sorry, Addison. Sure, I'll take a stab at that. Um, I mean, I'm more of a textile focused scholar personally, so I um, feel like that's where my like bias is. is um, and, um, but I think that's a great or an interesting question that you're asking about whether or not um, it's kind of a discrimination against women um, or, but I do think um, uh, that it's, a much larger question. Um, and um, again, I, I think cultural appropriation also has to be looked at more specifically. And I think probably within clothing, it can be become more of a sensitive issue um, because uh, clothing, mm, I, I think the way we interact with clothing is much more social than perhaps the way we interact with furniture or other ceramic items. And perhaps that I feel like that might be a reason why cultural appropriation might get up for brought up for textiles a bit more. I, I would jump in and just say that also, um, I think part, partially owing to the fact that of course, textiles are sort of a universe, it's a universally shared medium that uh, there's like a that they're kind of ripe territory for this this question, but um, you know, looking just thinking very kind of cursorily, and I know there are other people in the audience who can probably respond to this question just as easily. Uh, but you know, thinking about someone, a figure like the Eameses, who were um, avid collectors, just like Gerard was, of a lot of folk art and um, um, art objects from all over the world. You know, their, their iconic time life uh, stools are really just sort of a reconfigured form of a kind of um, solid wood, wood carved stool that you see in all, all over parts of Western Africa. So, I mean, I think, I just don't think that there's maybe, I, I someone can also correct me if I'm wrong, it's, I don't believe I've ever seen anything written on that particular subject, but certainly I know um, uh, that Pat Kirkham has written a lot about how that kind of collecting practice um, that Addison talks about with Gerard shaped the practice uh, of the Eameses as well. Uh, Kirsten, we have a question for you um, from Julia Feldman. I see a similarity in Myra Coleman's work and the joyful illustrations of Logo. Have you compared the two? So I haven't. Most of my work has been within the Werner workshop itself, um, but that's definitely something that I am interested in looking into. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. So I can explore that some more. And I believe that these are all the questions that we have. I'll give 
people a few minutes. We still have a few minutes. So if there's any, any lingering thoughts or congratulations that you all would like to offer, um, this was a fantastic session. And thank you again for your scholarship and your time and your energy. Um, and special thanks to Textile Society of America for putting uh, this fantastic um, symposium together.